Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us for the budget and racial equity panel. Uh, I know you've had a full morning of hearing different pieces of the budget and what those implications are. And we're going to do a deeper dive on specific slices of the budget with our uh, analyst team. And so I'm going to take just a couple of minutes to introduce everybody that's on this panel. And each of them is going to talk a little bit about their uh, respective role and uh, budget area of expertise. So uh, first, I want to introduce Laura Harker, who is our Senior Policy Analyst for Healthcare. Next, I want to introduce Alex Comardell, who is our Senior Policy Analyst for Economic Mobility. I also want to introduce Jennifer Lee, who is our Senior Policy Analyst for Higher Education. And then Dr. Stephen Owens, who is our Senior Policy Analyst for K-12 Education. And then Stephanie Angel, who is our Policy Fellow for the Criminal Legal System and Immigration. And finally, you've also heard a lot this morning from Danny Kansa, who's our Senior Policy Analyst for Tax and Budget and who is our Government Relations Coordinator. So without further ado, I want to start this uh, session off and we'll have some Q&A at the end. Uh, I will also encourage you that if you want to engage with any of the speakers, you can do that through Cadence. You can do it through the, the, the conference website. There is a connect function there and you're able to reach out to anybody that you would like to. So I encourage you to do that. Without further ado, I want to hand the floor off to Laura Harker, our Senior Policy Analyst for Healthcare. Hi, everyone. So thank you for joining us today. I'll kick off with a topic that is getting a lot more attention this year, of course, COVID-19 pandemic and the growing needs in healthcare, whether it's public health efforts to respond to the pandemic or if it's health coverage that we've seen more people needing as they're losing employment or losing income and need more access to health coverage. So I'll kind of kick off and talk through the agencies, the three main health agencies in our state and how the funding has changed, not just from the previous year um, where there were the 10% budget cuts that Danny spoke about, but also from the pre-pandemic levels in fiscal year 2020. So starting out with just our biggest health agency, the Department of Community Health, that's where the Medicaid program is um, housed and that is the program that serves about one in five Georgians and provides health coverage to children, to people with disabilities, to seniors. And so it's a really important source of coverage for healthcare in our state and the Peach Care program as well, which covers children who make the households that have more moderate incomes um, that are a little bit higher than the Medicaid threshold. And it also runs the state health benefit plan, which provides health insurance to teachers and other public employees. So this is really our biggest pot of health spending. And because of the way the Medicaid program is structured, it brings in more federal money when we're in an economic downturn, like we saw during the pandemic. So this agency has really fared better um, because of that federal support. There's been a $400 million increase since just last year in the budget. And that mostly is going towards program growth, uh, as you heard earlier with more people enrolling in Medicaid. So many more people are on Medicaid right now. Um, and even just in the low income Medicaid program, um, that's a program that's based on income eligibility. That program itself is growing $132 million in need in this past year. Uh, so that's where most of that new money is going. And also to make up for some of the changes in federal matching funds as the state's uh, per capita income increases and it has in the past several years, the federal government starts to chip in a little bit less each year. So the state has to fill in that gap. And so that's where a lot of that new funding is going to. Um, but really the biggest new change for this year's budget outside of just Medicaid growth is really towards the Patients First Act. And I'll talk a little bit more about that funding, but that for the first year in Medicaid, it will be about $68 million to implement that. And there's also some money that Alex will talk about in human services to actually implement some of the eligibility systems for that new program. But some other uh, good changes that we did see within the DCH budget was also just around more work on protecting people living in long-term care facilities like nursing homes. So there's some additional money, about $5 million almost for surveys to make sure that we're having safe conditions in those facilities and that we better understand conditions in those facilities. And also another two and a half million dollars has been added to the budget for primary care residency slots, which is a big 
help with addressing provider shortages and making sure we have enough primary care physicians who can stay in the state after they attend medical school here. If you practice here and you go to school here, you're more likely to stay in the state and practice. So that's a good addition as well. So getting a little bit more into the Patients First Act, we did see two waivers that were proposed through Governor Kemp's Patients First Act. The first is the Medicaid waiver that I discussed earlier, that 68 a million, well, 76 million total in the budget this year for that, and that was approved in October. And then we also had another waiver that is related more to the marketplace, the healthcare.gov uh, in individual insurance market, and that was approved in November of this of last year as well. So looking at the Medicaid waiver, that is what will start first. Um, that will begin enrolling people in July of this year. And that will basically be a partial Medicaid expansion with work requirements and premiums. So instead of expanding fully up to people making slightly above the poverty line, that 138% y'all may have heard about, um, this will just expand Medicaid up to 100% of poverty. So that's about $12,000, $13,000 a year for an individual. But in addition to meeting the income requirement, you also have to show and document that you are working or volunteering 80 hours a month and then also you have to pay a premium or else you'll be disenrolled. So if you don't meet these two requirements, you will be losing coverage within about two month grace period. But really we've seen in other states that means immediately a lot of people are dropping off of coverage. Either they may not know about the guidance, they may have so many other barriers like broadband access um, that may limit them from reporting hours. Um, also just premiums, there's a uh, decisions there about whether you can afford those. So um, there's definitely been in other states a drop of coverage as a result of these uh, issues. And we expect to see some challenges, especially around the work requirements and potentially the Biden administration may look at um, either rescinding part or all of the waiver. That would take a longer process because you have to, or the federal administration would have to show that they are, is not meeting the program requirements. And so as a result, that could also be something we have to look out for about whether there's some challenges from either the federal administration or legal challenges to making sure this waiver um, does or does not go through. Um, but really, I think the other big piece with this waiver is that it covers or is expected to cover about 65,000 people over the entire five years of the demonstration, um, whereas Medicaid expansion, full Medicaid expansion will cover over half a million people so it's really, you know, it's good to see some people having some opportunity to get coverage, but it's really a small portion of our total 1.4 million people that are uninsured. And we're also looking at spending almost five times more per person of the 60,000 people that are expected to enroll compared to Medicaid expansion. So there's still that stronger return on investment that's available through Medicaid expansion and also just a larger number of people that could get covered, which really has better outcomes for the health system as a whole. Uh, just a second waiver, I'll talk about the 1332 waiver that is expected to start in January 1st of 2022, and that will kick off with a reinsurance program, which will be a good thing as far as helping to reduce premiums in the healthcare.gov marketplace. And there is an expected cost to that is not included in the budget right now. So they'll probably look at coming back in the amended budget to add that about $100 million to fund that program. But the second phase is really the piece that's a little more concerning because it would eliminate healthcare.gov and it would leave direct enrollment directly through brokers and through insurance companies. And so that's taking away the most popular option that most people enroll through healthcare.gov and it's also not creating any new options for coverage. You can already enroll through brokers. Um, and it also doesn't increase any of the assistance as far as outreach, helping people find plans and connect to plans. That now a lot of that funding was cut during the uh, previous federal administrations. So there's concerns there about people losing coverage as we transition away from that model and um, into direct enrollment. So moving into the other two agencies, Department of Behavioral Health, this agency is one that has seen many cuts uh, just because they rely so much on general funds, general taxpayer money. They don't get as much federal support as the Medicaid program does and doesn't 
often utilize Medicaid as much to the ability it could. Um, so although there is a $22 million increase this year, that was mostly to make up for the loss that's expected in the Medicaid match during the public health emergency. Um, so it's really required increase there. It's not really funding a lot of new programs. Um, but then also when you look at pre-pandemic levels, the budget is still almost $70 million short of that. So there's still some need to look at restoring funds, especially for peer support services and a lot of the support and supported employment and supported housing programs. Um, but there are some promising additions as well, like 100 new slots for the now in comp waivers for people who are now waiting on the waiting list to get services. Um, there's also some funding for housing voucher programs to expand the pilots for that. And also some new compliance specialists to make sure we're managing um, the Department of Justice settlement that we're currently in and making sure we're providing enough housing and supports for people. So closing out on Department of Public Health, there was this very, very slight increase, only about $800,000. And that was mostly for funding um, some programs at Grady Memorial Hospital, and also a pilot program for people who are at risk of contracting HIV to fund PrEP medication for that group, a smaller group of people over three years. Um, but there was no additional funding for county health departments, um, which is really they're relying so much on the federal money that has come in for the COVID response, um, but the state has not been contributing to making sure that there's some long-term stability for those health departments. And that's where most of the state funding goes is to granting support for local health departments. And then looking also just compared to prior to the pandemic, the public health budget is still $7 million short. And just to kind of break it down, um, ending on this per person, you can see from about 2014 when the Great Recession cuts really hit the state and that budget pretty hard. Um, we just haven't recovered to that level when you look and break it down by population and, and we're still falling short on that. And I think that there's some opportunities to discuss restoring some funds to public health, not just from the federal money, um, but making sure that the state is contributing and supporting those efforts in the long term and our recovery from the pandemic. And with that, I will pass it to Alex to discuss human services. All right. Let's see. Good morning, everyone. And again, I'm Alex, and I'll walk us through the budget request for the Department of Human Services. Uh, DHS, for those who don't know, is responsible for providing protection for Georgia's most vulnerable, including children in the foster care system and the aging population. The agency is also tasked with administering federal safety net programs, such as food stamps and, and many others. Uh, the governor is requesting very small increases in select programs administered by DHS. The request amends the current fiscal year spending plan by providing just a 0.5% bump in spending and for the next fiscal year increases funds for 1%. The amended budget request brings the FY 2021 budget, our current budget year, for the agency to $800 million, up from $796 million. If approved, the governor's budget request would raise it slightly more to $803 million in the new fiscal year. DHS is the state's child protection arm providing child welfare services. The agency investigates and provides case management services for reports of child abuse and neglect. The budget request makes no changes to the current or new fiscal year budget for child welfare services. Through the Division of Family and Child Services, DFACS, housed at DHS, the agency manages the state's foster care and adoption system. DFACS staff and partners throughout the state assist with the placement of children who become involved in the foster care system. Due to a one-time increase in Federal Medicaid Assistance Program, or FMAP, approved in COVID uh, relief legislation, the agency is able to replace about $2 million in state funds with increased federal dollars to pay for foster care maintenance payments. If approved, the request for the new fiscal year, FY 2022, anticip anticipates a loss in the enhanced FMAP and adds about $6.5 million to continue foster care maintenance payments. Additional funds are included to address an increase in adoptions as well. The current fiscal year budget for adoptions will remain unchanged. 
but if approved, the new fiscal year budget will add about $4.5 million for adoption assistance. The Division of Aging Services at DHS provides support to Georgia's elderly population, adults with disabilities, and their caregivers. The division employs staff that investigate reports of elder abuse and administers services that support the economic and health needs of the elderly. The budget request makes no changes for the current fiscal year, but does propose an additional funding for the new fiscal year. The request would add about $974,000 to add just 13 adult protective service caseworkers to investigate reports of abuse, neglect, and or exploitation of seniors and adults with disabilities. The budget would also add about $230,000 to add three public guardianship caseworkers to coordinate and monitor all services needed for the health and well being of guardianship clients. Public guardianship case managers, just in case you are, are unfamiliar with them, act as surrogate decision makers and advocate for persons under guardianship and also coordinate and monitor all services needed for the support, care, education, health, and welfare of guardianship clients. BFACS, uh, particularly, was responsible for delivering an unprecedented amount of income support and other forms of assistance to Georgians with very little or no income during COVID-19's uh, economic crisis. Many of these programs are federally funded, including the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP, uh, more commonly known as food stamps, Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, TANF, Medicaid, Nutrition Assistance for Women, Infants, and Children, WIC, LIHEAP, and several others. The request amends this current fiscal year budget to transfer about $412,000 from foster care to cover contracts for conduit the private corporation responsible for electronic benefits transfer, or what's commonly referred to as EBT in the state. EBT is used to issue those payments through for food stamps and WIC and even TANF to individuals and families enrolled in those programs. And the contract with Conduit is essentially uh, increased on a case-by-case -case, uh, caseload basis. So as the increase in the caseload has grown, you know, substantially in the last year, so has the amount of money that we have to pay to conduit to make sure that we are properly managing those EBT cards. The request also adds about $700,000 in the current fiscal year and then $944,000 in the next fiscal year to add staff to screen applicants for Medicaid under the Governor's Patients First Act, which Laura discussed earlier. Despite the very small increases I just described in only a few program areas, some that are so small that even the Division of Family and Children's Services Director characterized it as a flat budget, the governor's budget request would maintain about $29 million in harsh cuts to the department enacted after COVID-19 in the amended, and $26 million in the new fiscal year. What are these cuts meant for human services? And I'll focus mostly on public benefits access since the safety net has become such a critical part of Georgia's pandemic response. This means Georgians may not expect fast processing times for public benefits. State workers have seen their caseloads climb exponentially since the start of the public health crisis. News of another year without substantial safety net funding for the department likely adds fatigue to state workers, the majority of whom are women and people of color who are already dealing with cuts ordered by the governor prior to the coronavirus pandemic's impact on the state budget that actually went into effect in the fall of 2019. The agency's leadership revealed that caseloads for SNAP and other public assistance programs were already backlogged, with workers expected to process far more than they could handle despite historically low unemployment rates in Georgia. Fast forward to today, in a monumental pandemic's impact on our state, the state has processed more applications in the last year than it did in any previous year, a spike in demand that puts more pressure on the state to fight rising poverty, but again, having to do so with far less money. With that, I'll pass it to my colleague, Jennifer Lee, to walk us through higher ed. Thanks, Alex. My name is Jennifer Lee, and I am the policy analyst who focuses on higher education here in Georgia. Um, and I'm gonna walk you through the three state agencies that are responsible uh, for managing public education beyond high school here in the state. So the first and largest is the Board of Regents or the University System of Georgia. And funding to colleges and universities 
under the Board of Regents went up $131 million. That's due to formula funded increases. Uh, but it's still down $111 million from fiscal year 2020. And actually about half of the increase that we're seeing in the proposed budget for next year is due to making up for the fact that we failed to fund the formula increase in the budget passed last summer. So you'll see in the amended budget for this year that we're currently in that $65 million, $65 million to address the fact that we did not fund the formula last year. The Board of Regents also administers um, many other programs, although the vast majority of the money goes to colleges and universities, but some of those programs include public libraries or cooperative extension services. All of those budgets were flat and maintain the 10% budget cuts from FY 2020. So although it looks like there is an increase, um, really we're just getting back to funding the formula in the way that we should and there has been no progress made on any of the cuts that were made in the budget passed last year. The second uh, system that I'll talk about is the Technical College System of Georgia. Um, same story here. We see $7 million more for technical colleges due to the funding formula, but that's still down $26 million from the 2020 budget. So none of the big cuts, the big 10% cuts made from last year were restored at all. And all of the non-technical education programs run by the Technical College System of Georgia, um, most notably adult education services, which are for those Georgians who do not have a high school credential. Um, those programs all maintain their 10% cuts and have flat budgets for this year. And the last uh, agency that I wanna talk about is the Georgia Student Finance Commission. This is the agency who administers the state funded dual enrollment program and also our lottery funded HOPE programs. Dual enrollment funding is flat for this year, which is a cut of about 12% from 2020. This program is interesting because uh, some of the cuts that were made in last year's budget were meant to correspond with legislation passed last year to restrict some of the enrollment growth in dual enrollment. This had been a rapidly growing program uh, for several years, but it seems the pandemic has really halted the growth in this pr program. Um, dual enrollment, while dual enrollment is up slightly in the university system of Georgia, in the technical college system of Georgia, which was the most popular choice for dual enrollment students in the state, fall to fall, the changes from the previous fall to the fall before, dual enrollment is down 20%. So the fact that dual enrollment is down so much means that this flat budget um, will most likely maintain the level of enrollment that is currently in the program. Um, but of course, the fact that dual enrollment is down because of the disruption the pandemic has caused um, is not a good thing. So that's where the dual enrollment budget is for this year. Um, the Georgia Student Finance Commission also manages uh, several state funded scholarships, which experienced a 10% cut also last year. All of those cuts remain. Uh, the REACH scholarship is flat for this year, but last summer did manage to get a $1 million addition into the state budget. I want to talk a little bit about lottery funds. Um, in higher education, we have the general funds that come from uh, taxes and fees that fund the colleges and universities, but lottery funds are a very important source of revenue for certain higher education programs, mainly the HOPE scholarships and grants. So unlike our general revenue, lottery funds grew, uh, continued to grow and are expected to grow to $1.3 billion for fiscal year 2022. And about half of that, or a little under half of that, is required to be saved in a shortfall reserve account. Um, there's basically a separate rainy day fund account just for the lottery to make sure that the state can pay its HOPE scholarship and grant obligations 
So by law, about $604 million is saved in that reserve account, but there is an additional um, nearly $800 million saved on top of that that um, is intended to be used for education. Lottery funded programs um, saw small increases just to meet expected need. There's been no increase in the award levels, but Hope Grants and Scholarships saw a $16 million increase in the budget uh, to meet projected need. Hope GED, the Hope GED program have remained flat. Uh, low interest loans and student access loans uh, remain flat at $26 million. I wanna lift this program up a little bit just because it's quite unusual. Uh, Georgia is the only state who makes an annual, approach pro an annual appropriation to a student loan program. Um, and this is funded with lottery dollars. It's a, uh, the assembly, General Assembly has made um, an appropriation of $26 million in lottery funds to this loan program um, for the past several years. And then last but not least, of course, lottery funds are pre-kindergarten program here in Georgia. Saw small increases just due to the formula, um, but no increases there. So the overall picture in higher education is that all of the cuts from the previous year remain, except for the formula funded increases um, where the formula earned additional dollars just based on changes in enrollment that would normally happen. So I will uh, switch it over now to Dr. Stephen Owens, who will talk about the K-12 budget. Thank you so much. All right. Once I get control of the screen, I'm going to share my PowerPoint with y'all. Okay, so I believe it's already been said here, um, but I just want to remind everyone as we talk about the budget, the teacher in me feels compelled to remark, a fiscal year starts in the summer. So July 1st is when the fiscal year begins, goes through June 30 the next year. Just kind of keep that in back of mind as we talk about these years that we are in fiscal year 2021. We are only six months away from fiscal year 2022. And while we're talking about things we wanna keep in the back of your mind, $2.7 billion is sitting in a rainy day fund during a global pandemic. All right, about the K-12 education budget, this featured prominently in the governor's proposed budget as he proposed a 60% restoration of the cut uh, from the last year's budget. That would push forward about $393 million in remaining cuts. They'll have a reduction of 166 million due to declining enrollment. We saw a lot fewer students enter into the kindergarten grades and early education grades. The governor mentioned that these schools will be held harmless. That was more a remark about the law and how we fund schools that they have a year to budget for these cuts, but there will be no additional funding for those schools. They will take $166 million cut due to this declining enrollment. Um, training and experience health insurance, these are formulaic driven um, and increase 114 million. And then equalization and local five mil share. This is where we get into the weeds of how we fund schools in Georgia. Um, let me start with five mil share. We're going to pay 112 million fewer dollars into that program. And what that means is that the average property tax, property wealth in Georgia has increased. So this is less money the state sends down to local districts as they are more able to pay for um, public education through local property taxes. So that means that the average property tax value that schools are receiving um, has increased. And this has been true of several years. But the increase to the equalization program, this is a grant meant to provide additional funding for, for school districts and lower wealth uh, communities. Every time we add money to that program, it means that while everyone's property values have gone up, sorry, the average property values have gone up, it's not equal across the state. 
it means that we are sending additional funding to low wealth school districts and that the gap between high wealth districts and low wealth districts is getting larger. And we'll talk more about that. Finally, the last big budget is, that I wanna talk about here is $57 million for increase to the employer contribution rate to TRS. This is actuarially determined. It's an expert that says, this is how much more we need every year. Georgia is unique nationally in the fact that we always pay uh, this expert determined amount. And it's one of the reasons that our pension is in such good shape compared to other states. This is what it looks like uh, when the state continues to balance budgets um, by making cuts to public education. We take no joy in this chart, but if this budget passes, the state of Georgia will have had a 20 year stretch where we've only met the minimum requirement to say that we have fully funded public schools twice. We'll have about a $400 million cut from 2021 and 2022 moving forward if changes aren't made to increase revenue to do right by our students. Sitting on top of the Quality Basic Education Act are grants that have either been chipped away at or completely underfunded year over year. One thing that we hear a lot about when we talk to school districts and school district leaders rather is uh, the amount of funding for student transportation. This is a grant that has stayed about equal or even decreased from 2002, while the cost of fuel um, benefits for employees and just the number of students that are required to take students to take to and from the school have all increased while the amount of funding remains flat or decreases. So school districts have to find that funding somewhere. And it usually means pulling from other parts of the schoolhouse. In the wake of the Great Recession, the General Assembly passed a First they capped and then passed a bill lowering that equalization grant. In one year alone, that meant $400 million fewer for low wealth school districts. Similarly, uh, at least since 2015, the state of Georgia has underfunded sparsity grants. Now this is a relatively small grant in the grant and scheme of things in K-12 education. It's meant for more rural, smaller schools that don't fit neatly into the Quality Basic Education Act on how to fund them. So we have an additional grant specifically for them, but at least since 2015, the state has funded this at about a quarter of the formula allowance, which means that this is about another billion dollars that schools have gone without, even on top of the cuts to the Quality Basic Education Act. Now, this is an analysis um, that this is the first time we've done this at GBPI. And it's, I'm gonna have to talk through it a little bit, but as we've seen equalization funding increase year over year since the Great Recession, we know that that meant that there's a bigger gap between uh, the haves and the have nots. And so if you analyze how much local school districts are able to receive through local property taxes, um, you're able to see a little bit more of what that gap looks like. So. You, I ranked every single school district based on the value of property taxes, the number of dollars they're getting per student in property taxes for uh, five mills, which is $5 for every you know, $1,000 of property tax wealth. And so the, the 18th ranked district is going to be one of the wealthiest districts in the state, um, 45th, 90th, and 35th. You can see how that ranking falls. And for the majority of school districts based on these, three mar these four markers, uh, their property tax values have increased pretty steadily from 2016 to 2021 to about 5 to 9 percent. But that 18th rank school district, again, this is one of the wealthiest school districts in the state uh, before 2016, their property tax collection has increased, increased 30 percent over that, that same time. Remember, in the wake of the Great Recession, we undercut the grant, the measure that was meant to equalize these districts. So instead of giving money to 75% of districts across the state of Georgia, now we only give money to about 50% of school districts across the state of Georgia. And we lowered that overall amount. What happens is that we now have a section of the state who can gain so much more in property taxes and there is no lever to support the rest of the state. And these are the sorts of analyses that are relied upon when states are sued for not prepare, for not providing an adequate public education 
Um, because if even as you think about your own district and the ability to raise taxes or raise funding for your own district, the state's responsibility is to provide an adequate public education for every single child. And it's clear that we're getting worse at that year over year. With that, I will hand it over to my colleague, Stephanie Angel. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, one second while I share the screen. Okay. All right. Whoa. Let's go back. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Stephanie Angel. I'm a policy fellow at GBPI focusing on immigration and the criminal legal system. Um, and I have two goals with my presentation today. Um, I'd like to give you a brief overview of the GDC budget, um, but also give you a little bit of insight into what has been going on in Georgia's prisons throughout this pandemic. Um, so when we take a look at the Georgia Department of Corrections budget, and for my purposes, I'll be referring to it as GDC, um, we see that between uh, FY 2021 and FY 2022, we have a flat budget. Um, the governor has not proposed uh, additional cuts to the budget this fiscal year, um, but what that really means is uh, a maintenance of the $82.9 million in, in cuts that were implemented last year. And so to give you a better idea of what that means, um, last year, we had a $22.4 million cut to the budget um, that came about through the freezing of vacant positions, the elimination of certain part-time jobs, and a reduction in overtime. Um, so in a time when many Georgians are out of work, um, you know, the cuts that were implemented last year uh, have reduced the opportunities available to Georgians this year. Um, an additional $6 million uh, were cut from the budget last year um, that resulted in an increase in commissary prices for people who are incarcerated. Um, this is making it dif more difficult for folks um, to access basic necessities like hygiene products during a global pandemic. Um, and then last year, before the pandemic started, um, there was a proposal in place uh, to add funding um, for individuals uh, making less than $40,000 a year to give them a $1,000 salary increase, um, as well as a 2% targeted salary increases um, for correctional officers due to the 42% turnover rate. And so no money ended up being allocated to those proposals due to the cuts. Uh, when we look at the FY21 amended budget and uh, FY22 proposal, um, what we really see is just a transfer of funds that already exist within um, the agency. And so there's going, there is a proposal to transfer um, $4.5 million to uh, residential substance abuse treatment centers and an additional uh, $3.9 million to cover expenses from physical health contracts. So before I dive into um, the pandemic's effects on folks who are incarcerated, I did want to give you a, brief, a bit of an overview on the population of people in the Department of Corrections custody. So as many of you I'm sure know, uh, Georgia proudly passed uh, criminal justice reform measures that were implemented in 2012. Uh, with that, uh, we did see a decline um, for a couple of years in the population um, in our prisons. Uh, but, you know, in 2014, we started to see that tick up again. And prior to the pandemic, we were almost at um, 2012 uh, population levels. Now, with the pandemic, as we all know, uh, everything closed down. And as a result, uh, there was a lot of, there are, you continue to be backlogs in the court system. And as a result, uh, we've seen a 16% decline in the population uh, within Georgia's Department of Corrections uh, facilities. Um, and so the Department of Corrections actually expects the population to rise to those pre-pandemic levels once uh, the court systems are fully back up and operational. Um, and so my hope is that we all uh, recognize that as a problem, right? Because if we do return to those pre-pandemic population levels, um, then that only confirms that the reforms that were passed in 2012 um, did not lead to long lasting change in our criminal legal system. And so uh, we really need to keep that in mind moving forward into this legislative session as well as future legislative sessions. So when we take a closer look at the population of folks who are incarcerated uh, in our prison system, that's where we really see racism at work. Um, you know, despite accounting for only 32.4% of Georgia's state population, Black Georgians comprise 60% of the GDC population, with the inverse being true for um, white folks within facilities. Um, you know, 
when we look at how COVID has impacted folks outside of uh, the prison system, the same can be said for, for people within the, within the prison system. And so as the state has been able to collect uh, data relating to um, infection rates and deaths uh, by race and ethnicity, we have not seen the same happen um, within facilities. And so over the summer, we actually submitted two open records requests um, to the Department of Corrections asking for disaggregated data um, related to COVID. And we were told that that data didn't exist and that the department was under no obligation to track that. And so again, I hope that we all recognize that that's a problem. Um, as we continue to go through this pandemic, um, we of course are witnessing appalling conditions within facilities. Um, and so I don't only want to highlight this as a problem, I want to give you a solution. And so um, the good people over at the Southern Center have allowed me to share one of their legislative proposals that I really think um, is going to address some of the issues that we're seeing. And so within Georgia prisons, you know, there's an insufficient amount of PPE, cleaning supplies, um, no ability to social distance, inadequate testing, and troublingly, uh, an over-reliance on lockdowns and solitary confinement as a means to isolate folks who do test positive. And so, um, during this session, uh, the Southern Center is actually proposing a, a way to keep the Georgia Department of Corrections accountable um, by requiring them to report uh, changes to policies and practices um, within 30 days after the declaration of a public health state of emergency. So that's going to help folks within the existing pandemic um, and also any future public health crises that might uh, come about in the future. And there, the, this proposal would also require um, a publication of tests administered, uh, positivity rates and fatalities, and have all that data disaggregated by race, ethnicity, and gender. And so, you know, I, I really hope that we all go into this session not forgetting the people who are inside of our jails and prisons. Um, these are our community, these are our community members as well. They have loved ones waiting for them. Um, and right now, uh, what we're seeing is really having prison sentence turn into death sentences. Um, there are 13,000 people within the GDC's uh, custody that have chronic conditions like COPD, diabetes, cancer. And so um, they're also at higher risk of dying or experiencing really severe symptoms as a result of this pandemic. And so with that, I just wanted to make sure that I highlighted that. Um, and so that's it for me. I will turn the screen over for a Q&A section, I believe. Thank you for that, everybody. That was a, a great discussion. And we have an opportunity here for approximately 13 minutes to do a little bit of audience Q&A. And there's been some questions in the queue already. Uh, please feel free, audience, to put in more. And again, if you want to connect with any of these panelists individually, uh, I would say check out the conference website. There's a connect function on there. You can drop messages and the like. And I'm David Schaefer, research director. You're also welcome to connect with me as well. Um, but I wanted to start off with a broad question uh, for each of the panelists to answer or whoever would like to uh, get into the topic. And it's a big one. And it's around the large question of racial equity that uh, has, uh, and racial inequity that has existed in Georgia from a structural standpoint for many years. And just to put the question out there, uh, what uh, is the biggest challenge for you in your policy area from a racial equity perspective? And what can audience members do to begin moving the state of Georgia in the right direction regarding that? So I just wanted to open the floor uh, to the panel for anybody that wanted to address those questions. And then we can start getting into some of the more specific questions that we've been receiving from the audience and we'll continue to receive. Thank you. I can, I'll, I'll start, um, you know, it's a great question. I'm glad that we're asking it in the context of spending, in the context of state spending during a pandemic driven recession, um, you know, the vulnerabilities in Georgia's safety net programs that we're experiencing that I laid out earlier on have existed long before the, the pandemic. They were quite apparent in previous recessions. Um, and they're the result of the compilation of policy choices that are driven by this attempt to end welfare as we know it. And that unfortunately keeps millions of Georgians near the bottom of the economic ladder, not just people of color, but also white folks. 
And uh, moreover, the racist attitudes, both the implicit and the explicit on both sides of the aisle in Georgia's General Assembly have really permeated the way that Georgia lawmakers fund our safety net programs, like food assistance, like direct cash aid, like Medicaid. Um, these attitudes and policies have led to harsh rules, such as the, the work requirements in the Governor's Patients First Act, which are literally designed to kick people off of health care, but rooted in anti-Black racism and stereotypes about the welfare queen and other harmful tropes that are embedded in Georgia's public policy. And it's also led to less spending. Um, this has particularly impacted Black families. Um, states that have larger shares of, black, uh, of a Black population are notorious for offering less help from the safety net. You know, for example, Georgia's cash assistance program, TANF, only reaches five out of every 100 families that are below the poverty line. And that is a statistic reinforced by Georgia's uh, budget failure to adequately appropriate funding intended for direct cash. Um, the reality is we're almost a year out from the start of this crisis and the hardship continues. It's worsened for some all across the state. In the last um, household pulse survey that the US Census Bureau administers, uh, it measures families' access to basic needs. It found that Black households in Georgia with children reported having much, much, much higher rates of food insecurity than any other group, 27% compared to 4%, 5%, and 6% for Asian, Latinx, and white households, respectively. What lawmakers need to be asking themselves is how does a budget that does not add additional state funding for core safety net services address that inequity versus maintain it or reproduce it, you know, guaranteeing an uneven recovery. We know and the evidence has told us time and time again, when you compare states that inject funding, <laughs> Siri trying to interrupt, inject funding into state economies through the safety net, that you can divert or avoid, you know, further, further inequity, furthering racial inequity and income inequality. And that's the approach that we need to take right now, not continuing to balance the budget with cuts on the backs of women and people of color as we have historically done. So I'll hop off my, my soapbox there and pass it to another colleague, but um, that's, that's one way that we need to be thinking about our recovery. I'll say that in K-12 education, um, we have this unique way of funding schools in the United States, which relies very heavily on the amount you can raise uh, for the value of the properties um, in your community. And that bakes in inequalities from years past based just on the neighborhood that you live in, which we know has been de determined and created by white supremacy over years. So what happens is I, I grew up in, I went to elementary school in Clayton County and then in middle school moved to Fayette County. That's a difference in $70 per student that can be raised in local property taxes. Um, that's hundreds of thousands of dollars when expanded out to the number of students that can create this huge difference in the opportunities allowed to these students. What also makes things difficult is Georgia is one of only eight states that does not provide additional funding specifically for students living in poverty. If we were to uh, advance a, a bill like HB 10, which has been pre-filed, um, this would go a long way in addressing the inequalities that have been baked in from years and moving past that towards an education system that does right by our black and brown communities. And I'll uh, jump in in higher education. I mean, when we look at higher education, I think there's such a potential for it to be a place uh, to produce more equitable outcomes in society. But to be honest, a lot of our colleges and universities right now um, really reproduce a lot of the social and economic and racial inequalities that already exist in society and that their students bring into the classrooms with them. Um, you know, it, it's difficult. I understand that it's difficult to disrupt that, but uh, really we're doing a pretty good job at reproducing. There are a lot of racial inequalities when you look at college completion outcomes, when you look at student debt and who is forced to borrow and how much student debt uh, students are carrying and also on who gets financial aid in Georgia. And one of the big opportunities lost, I think at the state level 
because there's so much work that can be done at the institutional level and at the system level, but at the state level, I think one of the big opportunities lost, they have the power of the purse, is to be able to look and use our financial aid systems to really push anti-racist, uh, to have anti-racist financial aid policy and push more equitable outcomes in that way. Um, right now, we provide the most dollars to families and students with the most resources. Um, and that's not gonna do anything to push more equitable outcomes. It's just going to, again, reproduce what we already have. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of opportunity there and an opportunity lost, I think, to make higher education a force for equity in our state. I will very briefly echo the, the comments of my colleagues and just bring it back to the way that our tax, the way that our state taxes and spends revenue is a direct statement of those values. And right now, we, we have made clear choices not to prioritize uh, many Georgia families, particularly those of, of color, particularly those at the lowest income levels. And so actually the, the tax system in our state operates so that those who earn the least pay the highest share of their income in state and local taxes. And the way that we spend funds from not auditing our, our billions in corporate tax credits, we don't look for waste, fraud, and abuse there, uh, to holding $2.7 billion in reserves just so that we can say we have more and, and use that as a talking point uh, is, is just one demonstration of how we are not doing everything we can to, develop, to deliver on that promise for all Georgians. I'll just add for healthcare, agreeing with everyone um, and their comments about just the safety net and the importance of that. Um, with health coverage, if you look at the highest uninsured rates in the state, um, Latinx Georgians have the highest rates of uninsured followed by Black Georgians. Um, and so looking at just the need to expand coverage is a huge for people of color in the state to actually have access to services. Um, but also thinking about how the state can do more to invest in prevention and in supports for people, um, including supported housing, childcare assistance, uh, so many needs that help to promote health and as overall, um, even um, environmental issues uh, that people are facing in housing. So addressing all of these issues that are outside of the healthcare system too, um, is really an important way the state can look at investing in not just healthcare treatment, but prevention and these supports as well. And I'll briefly jump in just from, uh, you know, the corrections perspective. Um, one of the biggest challenges that I see is just, um, there's a lack of sympathy for people who are incarcerated. Um, many people simply uh, say, you know, um, they did the crime, they have to pay the time, they don't care about the conditions within facilities. And so, you know, corrections is funded at a high level. It has a one billion, over $1 billion budget, but that doesn't mean that the money being spent um, is assuring any type of sanitary conditions for these people. Um, you know, there's a, there's a big difference uh, between punishment and abuse. And so um, if I can do anything uh, to advocate on behalf of, uh, of these individuals is just, uh, we need to take measures that hold the agency accountable um, because they can say all day that they're providing PPE, that they're cleaning facilities. Um, but, you know, folks that are representing these individuals, um, you know, have anecdotal evidence that says otherwise. And so, again, that's why I wanted to bring to light the proposal from the Southern Center that I think is a good step forward to ensure that um, taxpayer money uh, is being used uh, to provide at least humane standards uh, of living for these individuals. Thank you, everybody. Uh, as usually happens, time passes very quickly on this panel. We've only got about another two minutes to go before we need to wrap up. I did wanted to lift up one question that re we received from the chat and we're trying to address the others in the chat as, as fast as possible. Again, please know that you can connect with the panelists on the platform in the, uh, in the conference website if you wanna reach out to anybody. But I wanted to target this one to Dr. Stephen Owens and it was a very brief question that clearly school funding is not sufficient. And uh, what are the other things that could be done in order to fund QBE at the level of the schoolhouse? That's a great question. Um, I think that if there is any benefit to the fact that Georgia spends, is one of the 
lowest states when ranked or how much they spend per citizen, it means that there is a ton of common sense bipartisan ways that we could raise revenue that would benefit all Georgians. We, we got a fiscal note back from raising the tobacco tax to the national average, $700 million we have access to next year that would go so far in our state. And that's not just education. Um, we could uh, close loopholes for just the wealthiest Georgians, like the double deduction. We could analyze the billions with a B tax credits that we are handing out usually to people that aren't even working or serving here in Georgia. I mean, there's so there's so much low hanging fruit uh, that we could do more than just fully fund QBE. We could provide additional funding for students uh, living in poverty. We could expand Medicaid. We could do right by the Department of Corrections and our um, safety nets. I mean, this, this could go so far if we had the political will to do it. Great. And on that, I just want to thank every one of you, every panelist, every analyst. Thank you for being on this panel today. Audience, thank you for taking the time to ask such wonderful questions. Again, if you want to follow up with one of these speakers, you can do it through the conference platform. And, uh, you know, we're here and, uh, you know, welcome to kind of have more interaction with you. I need to wrap this up and hand off to our president and CEO, Taifa Smith Butler, for some closing remarks, and then she'll give you some further instructions about uh, some breakout networking uh, sections that we're going to have at the end of the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you, David, and thank you, team. <clears throat> I have a, a number of closing remarks on this piece of paper, but as you all know, sometimes I go off script, and, and I just have to underscore, I think Stephen wrapped us up uh, quite honestly um, with his remarks. Um, everybody has made the case uh, for why we need additional revenue at the end of the day. This is our pitch to you to inform you about where we are in terms of our state budget, um, in terms of the policy choices. And if you recall, that's what I said in the opening, our policy choices that we're making today amid a pandemic when there is still tremendous need in our state. And as Stephanie showed, the tremendous inequity we see in the Department of Corrections and the things that are happening within those facilities, how we can improve the lives of those who are incarcerated by addressing their human dignity, right? Just them and their dignity. Um, in terms of our human services budget, how can we best support the families who are suffering the most right now as these cuts persist? We must think about the safety net and allow the safety net to do its job. And we have not done that for years. Those of you who are part of the GBPI family and K-12 and care about public schools and care about education, there is no reason why we should continue to underfund our public schools today when our students are facing the most challenges in terms of access to instruction um, in digital learning, in addition to all the additional needs they have for their mental and social well being. So <clears throat> I think uh, we've done our job today. We've put race on the table, we've talked about resiliency today. And we put that on the table. And then the challenge for us is how do we advocate for an equitable, a fair recovery for all Georgians, but especially those who have been most harmed by this pandemic, most harmed by systemic racism, most harmed by the policy choices that we continue to make day in and day out that create this low tax environment, that create services that are under providing, I should say, not serving well uh, the, the constituents in this state. And I think it's time out, y'all, for status quo. Uh, I think as we move forward, knowing that there's still things that we have to do to help our families survive this pandemic, we, have mu we must think differently. And I'm encouraged from our legislators who joined us today, who are, are aware and agree that we have to think about our revenue structure differently. And I'm pleased to hear Republicans and Democrats alike talk about the need for 
revenues. And so I think that's a great starting point for all of you naysayers out there who think that we are some Pollyanna believers in, in what is possible. I believe that as we continue to show these data and show these data to you who will then lift up your own voices and champion these issues with us, that to Stephen's point, this is about political will. And political will can move when there is public will behind it. And that's where we need you. And so I want to thank you all for joining us today. I'm not going to reiterate data points. The team has done that. The PowerPoints will be available. Um, but I hope that you have taken something away from this morning. And next week, with our keynote panel, we will have a session on healthcare again to go deeper and hear from some voices from folks in the healthcare industry. We will have a K-12 education panel hearing again from Stephen and people in the field. And then we will hear from Drs. Dorian Warren and Dr. Um, Valerie Wilson from Community Change and the Economic Policy Institute to talk about how we can truly, with Alex, think about an equitable recovery. And my friends, this will mean we have to make tough choices. This means we may have to push back against status quo and it might be uncomfortable, but I think now is the time to demand better for our families. And so I want to thank you. I want to encourage you to go back to the platform, connect to some of the other people participating, and we're going to go into some breakout sessions now where you'll be able to connect with our staff and our team to talk a little bit more amongst yourselves about these issues and what to do next, quite honestly. Uh, budget hearings have completed this week. The session will restart day five next Tuesday, and then they'll plan the rest of their cal calendar. I encourage you to engage. We need your voices like never before if we truly are going to have an equitable recovery from here on out. And so with that, go back to Cadence, uh, make sure you select the networking option that you'd like to jump into. Our team will work on the back end to make sure you get connected uh, if, if there's any technical problems. And I just wanna thank you all for being here with us today. And if there's anything that you've enjoyed, any takeaway, if your knowledge has been increased and enhanced in some way, if your heart is palpitating even faster because you wanna engage, I wanna ask you to support GDPI. I want to ask you to go to Cadence and click on the donate button and support this work that we're doing to advocate for Georgians. Georgians who are Black, are Brown, who are in rural communities, who are disadvantaged uh, in different ways because we have not invested. I ask you to support our organization in this good work and join us um, so that we can really make a difference together. And with that, uh, thank you for joining us for day one. We look forward to you coming back next Friday, same bet time, same bet channel, <laughs> or maybe a different channel. But anyway, uh, we will enjoy, or I would say in, in um, go deeper into uh, this conversation about recovery next week. And with that team, I will turn it over to those of you who can click your own buttons and join the networking option that you'd like. Thank you so much for being with us today.